The following interview was conducted with our electrical engineering alumnus, George Anton Smith, for the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. George graduated from Purdue in 1976 and is one of the founders of the National Society of Black Engineers, also known as NSBE. He's currently retired, and one of the things that he does, he volunteers at Bethel New Life and serves as a business plan advisor. The interview took place on July 7th, 2018 in Oak Park, Illinois at the Oak Park Public Library. The interviewer is Tasha Zephyr. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> to begin, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Oh, well, um, well, you've already highlighted my education. Um, family, I have a wife that I've been married to for almost 38 years. We have a daughter uh, who has uh, just turned 36, and we have a grandson who is eight years old. So that's the family. Um, in addition to my Bethel New Life volunteer activity, I also volunteer at our church uh, as a Sunday school assistant, sometimes teacher. Um, you know, when our grandson started Sunday school, I decided to start it too. <laughs> and that was in kindergarten. Um, he completed kindergarten, first grade, and moved on to a different area of Sunday school for second grade. Um, however, they asked me, because they were shorthanded in the first grade class, to stick around. So what I say is, uh, my grandson got promoted and I got held back. <laughs> So um, that's really, um, you know, what I really enjoy right now is uh, that, you know, this great opportunity that I have to be with my family and, mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, I just totally integrated myself into the activities of my grandson. I'll just be totally honest with you. I told him it's going to be like this until he turns 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm his shadow or if he's my shadow, but we are together a lot. Mm, that's wonderful. Um, okay. So, um, tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up, like in your pre-college life, in high school, or even younger. What was it like growing up at that time? Okay, well, um, growing up, first of all, my family, uh, uh, my mother and father, George and Bertha Smith, both college graduates from historically black colleges. My father graduated from Tuskegee University. My mother graduated from Miles College, both in Alabama. So my parents' roots are in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the lifestyle for me as I was growing up uh, was fantastic. Uh, we always lived in a good neighborhood. Um, you know, and uh, our house was, you know, as as nice as any house that I had seen, uh, you know, anyone else in during that period of time, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, because my parents were college graduates, they were education oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, in fact, was a Chicago public school teacher, and she taught uh, primary grades, first, second, and third. So as you might imagine, I had a great head start because here I am, you know, the son of this primary school teacher, uh, a lady who could handle a classroom of 30 <laughs> Chicago school kids. And I was an only child. So I was no match for my mother, okay? I don't know what they did to put up the guardrails for me, uh, but, uh, you know, I did what they told me to do when I was growing up, and I just found that life would be a lot easier that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, life for me when I was growing up, uh, uh, with my parents being from Birmingham, most of their friends were people who had migrated up from Alabama for a better life. Uh, and so the people that, you know, uh, uh, I viewed as the extended family were all people from, you know, my parents' neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, in Alabama. Um, you know, as an aside, um, there's actually three of, of the founders of Nesby whose parents 
were Chicago public school teachers. Um, and it just so happens that our nickname uh, uh, is the Chicago Six. And so be basically because we all came from uh, Chicago. And uh, early on here, I think it, it's important to note that five of us went to the same high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and Edward Coleman, who did not go to Lynn Bloom High School, went to Morgan Park. Edward Coleman and I were in elementary school together. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, in elementary school from sixth, um, sixth grade to through eighth grade. And to put that in perspective, uh, for people who are aware of the Beatles singing group, I met Ed Coleman before the Beatles came to America. <laughs> you know, they were young people. Um, and they're not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so life in the neighborhood was great. I mean, it was all about sports. Um, Education was just, you know, something that uh, came relatively easy. Uh, as long as I did my homework, I got good grades. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't thinking about ambition or anything like that. Uh, I was just thinking about basketball, football, baseball, because that's what we did in the neighborhood every day during mm -hmm. the summertime. Um, but one of the things that was pivotal in my life um, is that uh, my father, who was a chef by profession, also had many other skills, and one of them was that he was an excellent carpenter. Mm. And so uh, he decided to remodel our basement, and he was able to do everything except the electrical work. Um, you know, and this is when I was 11, 12 years old. Um, and so he had to call an electrician. When the electrician was there, my father said, this guy has a good trade. You need to talk to him about what it takes to become an electrician. So I go over to the electrician, and I ask him about it. And the first thing he asked me is, how good are you in math? I said, that's my best subject. He said, well, then you should go to college and major in electrical engineering. So that's where this whole notion of engineering came from. And quite frankly, I didn't know what that would lead to. I thought I would be going to college to learn how to be an electrician. <laughs> Okay, um, and so, um, you know, just to connect the dots between that and how I wound up at Purdue, mm -hmm. um, is that the very first assembly in our freshman year in high school, um, they uh, had a, a gentleman named Eric Harris who was being honored. He was a great basketball player. It was a very competitive basketball team at the time. There were some members of the Chicago Bulls that I saw in our gym watching these guys play. I mean, we had guys, you know, 6'9", 6'8", 6'7", on a high school basketball team. So anyway, Eric Harris was a, you know, a, a celebrity in the high school just for that alone. But he was being honored for getting straight A's two years in a, in a row and he was awarded with what was called the S emblem for scholarship. So he had his Letterman jacket, the Lindblom L, and he also had a, a he earned a, an S emblem for straight A's two years in a row. So I'm sitting in the audience, Brian Harris and I, who became my best friend um, quickly, like on the first day of high school, <laughs> Uh, we're sitting next to each other, and I said something that I thought I said to myself, but years later, I mean, you know, 30 years later, I asked him, uh, if, you know, if, if he remembered that. And he said he, he remembered it. I didn't say it to myself. I said it out loud. I said, uh, I'm going to learn how to play basketball. Uh, I'm going to get straight A's two years in a row, and I'm going to Purdue to major in electrical engineering just like Eric Harris. So that was how the dots were connected between this conversation with the electrician. Uh, you should go to college and major in electrician, electrical engineering. And then the first time I hear electrical engineering was on the first day of high school. So I'm following this guy. I, I know I locked in right there. This is what I'm going to do. And, and so what I say is uh, those are my three pledges to myself. And what I say is two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
basketball career didn't take off. There wasn't there wasn't a basketball <laughs> career. There was there was basketball fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, my claim to fame is that I was a point guard on the intramural championship team in both the junior year of high school and the senior year of high school, and that was the extent of my athletic prowess. <laughs> Um, uh, so it's a good thing that I did my homework mm-hmm. because engineering took me a lot further than basketball was going to take me. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, you know, and I, when I think back on what life was like growing up, it was, you know, more of an innocent time. Uh, there wasn't danger in the streets in my neighborhood. Um, and then I look back on the kids that, that I grew up with just from the neighborhood before I met any of the kids in high school. One of them is a, an appellate judge in, mm-hmm. in Chicago area. One of them uh, became a, uh, a CPA uh, and you know was a director level financial manager at uh, a, a, one of the Fortune 500 companies, Navistar. Uh, another one was vice president of um, um, of the utility company that services our area, the, in the western suburbs, Nightcore. Um, so you know, just just looking back, and then I became an engineer. Um, and what was people, the name of the neighborhood again? Sorry. Um, well, it's on the south side of Chicago, um, I think they call it Washington Heights. Um, we didn't really think about neighborhoods and you know in terms of the, you know these names that they've assigned to the neighborhoods now, but I think that's what they call it. Okay. Washington Heights. Ninety um, seventh and Peoria, close to ninety uh, seventh and Halsted. That's where I grew up. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, the other aspects of my childhood, uh, I'll just, I hadn't thought about this before, but I'll just touch on it. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole notion of what makes a leader uh, and, you know, when is that likely to surface mm-hmm. in a child as that person is developing? Well, that surfaced very early on with me. Um, and it wasn't a, a notion of me wanting to necessarily lead others. It was that I did not want to be led. Mm. Uh, and if I was going to be led, I had to be led by someone that I really, really respected. Um, and that became clear when I was in the Boy Scouts. Okay. Um, we had a patrol meeting, and one of the kids in the patrol meeting not just one of the kids, but the patrol leader at the time. Um, he started crying for no reason. You know, so I stood up and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not having crying in, in this Boy Scout meeting. And so I said, I'm the patrol leader now. We're not having a vote. And so I took over that patrol. And then later on, um, I became the assistant senior patrol leader for our troop. And that was strategic um, because the biggest guy in the troop was a big, big man, football player size. Um, he was a boy, but he was a man body named Leroy. Uh, and so I thought it would be best if Leroy were the senior patrol leader. Uh, I could call the plays and Leroy can make sure they do it. <laughs> so um, that was the first time that you know I felt the uh, the need to lead, um, and you know when I got into high school, uh, the whole focus in high school was just to get those grades so that I could get into Purdue University. I mean, you know, really, that was it. Everything after that, after that, you had to learn how to play basketball, have fun with the guys. Um, but uh, you know, I had I was I was singularly focused on Purdue University. 
it is the only school that I applied to. Uh, and my thinking at the time was, hey, look, I, you know, I got the straight A's, I got the S emblem, you know, I was third in the class after the freshman year. Uh, after I got the, the S emblem, my ranking started to decline because that notch had been already taken care of, and the only other thing was left was to get into Purdue. So, um, so um, I didn't discover until after my father passed, which was a good 20 years later, that uh, because of my academic excellence in high school, uh, a local congressman had uh, told my parents that he could get me a full ride scholarship to the University of Illinois. Um, my parents never told me that. My father, my mother told me after he passed that he said, my son wants to go to Purdue and I want to send him. Um, so they turned down a full ride scholarship. The total scholarship money that I got coming out of high school was a $100 award from the Chicago Engineers Club. Uh, and the balance of my college education was paid for by my parents. And that was something that they were proud of. Um, now, of course, when I was in college, I was on the co-op program, so I, um, I contributed every penny above and beyond my living expenses to that college fund that my parents were, uh, were paying. Mm -hmm. And so, but it, it worked out. It worked out very good. And I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, growing up as a child, I was an only child. Uh, in fact, uh, I've done. I haven't done. I have a cousin who's done some Ancestry.com research on my father's side of the family. And I've discovered through her research that in my family, on my father's side, we have five generations of only children dating back to my grandmother. So, you know, grandmother was an only child, father was an only child, I'm an only child, daughter's an only child, and our grandson is an only child on my father's side. So what's the significance of that? Um, I have um, speculated that being an only child is one of the reasons why uh, I became so close with my fellow founders. You know, because we all met as freshmen in high school uh, and we were all on the freshman track team. And so as I think forward about that experience, um, you know, and think about my, my friends, uh, there is a common denominator, either they're an only child or an only, they were an only male or they were the oldest male with, uh, in some cases, a, you know, significant, um, age difference between the next male in the family. So I think there's some, there is some, uh, you know, some value in noting that, that I think that contributed to the bond that we had. Mm -hmm. um, so the environment in Chicago at the time, you know, I know Chicago's viewed as a, a you know, this rough and tumble city. Um, and there were, you know, there were times that we found ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time and got jumped by people. Um, you know, I've been jumped by white gangs and black gangs in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't grow up during a period of time when people were shooting at others. Um, you know, and if you got in a fight, somebody can't had a black eye, and the next day you're playing chess or checkers together or playing basketball together, it was over. Um, um, so another thing about my early education that I think is important to note is that even though, you know, I was, you know, sort of a smart kid, I was also a smart aleck kid. Sometimes spoke uh, when it wasn't necessarily my turn in terms of what the teacher was thinking. Um, I went to Catholic school until the fifth grade. And, uh, 
And it wasn't until the fifth grade that I got, got sort of labeled by the teacher as a smart kid. And it was, it was because I was in this new Chicago public school, Wacker Public School, and the teacher asked a question, and I'm this new kid in the class, I thought I'd blurt out an answer that you know everybody would laugh and giggle at. So the teacher asked the question, I have no idea what it was, but I blurted out, Montana. And it was a geography question. And I was expecting everybody to get, laugh and giggle. And the teacher said, that's right, George. And she looked at me with the, you know, the brightest smile. You know, and as I thought about that later, obviously she became, became my, my favorite teacher. But that was the first time that I remember a teacher smiling at me. So think about that. Think about that. And that, that one smile turned me from a smart aleck to a smart kid, and I was proud of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that impacts me uh, to this day, you know, as a, as a Sunday school teacher. You know, as I walked in there for the first time, um, you know, you better believe I flashed you know, all my teeth in the smile. I get eye contact and, a, and I share a smile with every student that comes in that room. And I do the same thing with the parents too. Mm -hmm. So um, that had a big impression on me. So let's say I didn't have this great supportive background at home, okay, knowing that I was going to be on the college track somehow because my parents were. Um, and uh, you know, my parents were going to make sure that I was successful in my education no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's some parents that don't have that background. And so, uh, you know, what if, what about that other student who the teacher never smiled at? Right, exactly. Okay? How are we going to, you know, help them? So I think about that occasionally when we think about what are we going to do, you know, to help our next generation. You know, in um, particular, my, our next generation is coming up now. My grandson is eight years old. Uh, you know, we have to build these kids up so that they feel important. You know, I wonder just, you know, how effective the school system is at doing that. Um, and I strongly believe that we cannot delegate uh, education to the school system. Schools to the school system is a partner. But they're, and they're, they're, it, the education of our kids is not to be delegated to the school system. Um, and so that, you know, that impacts the way uh, I think about how I'm going to interface with my grandson. Mm -hmm. You know, now I have time to do it now because I'm retired. I didn't have time like that when our daughter was growing up. I was traveling all over the place working for Hewlett Packard. You know, I was traveling... Uh, every week, three nights a week, when our daughter was growing up, all the way through age nine. So I wasn't able to, you know, help out in, you know, in the capacity that I can help out now with my grandson. Uh, but I would say, you know, on my plate right now, that's the most important thing in my life is to make sure that, you know, for whatever years I have on the planet, hopefully until he turns 35, um, you know, that, you know, he has the advantage of knowing as much of what I know as I can infuse into him. Mm -hmm. Nice so, to see all that come full circle. Yes. <laughs> so, all right, so then you had the singular goal of getting to Purdue, and you got in. <laughs> so what was the environment like during your time at Purdue as an incoming freshman? Well, uh, first thing that I think is really important for people to realize is that we had an unfair advantage. You know, although they looked at us as uh, disadvantaged engineering students, we had an unfair advantage. And that unfair advantage is the fact that 
I had all my best friends. These were not just people that I was in high school with. These were literally my best friends through my entire high school experience from freshman year on. So the uh, freshman year of college, socially, for me, was like the fifth year of high school. And so, you know, I had eight years of, you know, life experience with these guys. Um, so, you know, I really didn't feel that same uh, need to reach out and establish, you know, a social network like most kids do when they go to college. They meet new people and they, you know, establish new relationships and all that. Um, you know, for, for us, we already had our group and, you know, other people were to a certain extent drawn to us because of the chemistry that they saw that we had. Um, uh, but we each had different personalities. Um, there's, there was a lot of type A um, in, in many of us, um, but we were able to function together well in spite of those you know, uh, uh, those aggressive genes that we had floating around together. Um, so f from an academic standpoint, um, it's important to know that it was a cultural shift for me and, and the rest of my guys. Uh, to a certain extent, I feel like I felt it greater than they did in conversations that I've had with them. Growing up in Chicago, you know, there was a million blacks. Everything was black. There were a few teachers that were, you know, that were white. But, you know, I came from a black culture. And so now I'm in West Lafayette, Indiana, and it's a white culture. Okay? Um, and I, I wasn't particularly comfortable. I mean, I was comfortable in that I had all my guys there, and, you know, we just continued the way we continued. Um, you know, another thing is that we came in with a lot of confidence. Okay. And you, to a certain extent, you might say that we were overconfident. Um, some people might consider us as having appeared to be arrogant. Um, and if they uh, felt that way, I apologize. <laughs> <coughs> But also, I think it's important to remember that this was a time in American history uh, when there were very, very, very low expectations about the capabilities, the uh, academic and intellectual capabilities of black folks. Um, you know, this was a time in American history when they were thinking that blacks were not smart enough and didn't have the leadership potential to be quarterbacks uh, on football teams, okay? So this was the in environment, and yet here we are, scholars admitted to, to study um, engineering at Purdue University. You know, and at the time, there were three standout schools in the United States, MIT, in the East, Stanford, in the West, and Purdue uh, in, in the Midwest, three top three standout engineering schools. So here we are uh, in this world that has very low expectations for you know, our abilities to succeed, to succeed in this new arena. And yet, uh, nevertheless, we were overconfident that, that we could do this. Well, once we started taking classes, then the confidence started to, uh, to decline a bit mm -hmm. because you know, it wasn't that the material was so much more difficult than anything that preceded it, but the pace. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was what, you know, seemed different to me, that, you know, one day in, in college taking, you know, engineering and pre-engineering classes was the equivalent of, you know, one week uh, in high school, maybe even more. And so... Uh, you know, there wasn't any, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't procrastinate because you'd just fall too far behind 
if you you know if you allowed yourself to procrastinate. So um, you know when you ha- you we haven't fully matured yet, and you'd rather still be going outside to play every day, particularly in my case, play basketball at the Co-Rec Gymnasium. Mm-hmm. Um, then that that creates a challenge. Has nothing to do with you know your capability. Um, but going through that first year, um, we changed a trend that had existed at Purdue in uh, in engineering. Before we got there, eighty um, percent of the black freshman class was flunking out every year. Okay, the year that we got there, eighty percent retained. And for the Chicago Six, it was 100%. And that, uh, that theme of 100% is one that uh, has continued throughout my life. Um, you know, my attitude is I want everybody to succeed. You know, all of us succeeded uh, at Purdue and getting through that engineering program. Um, as far as interactions with students, um, you know, there wasn't a, a great deal of social, um, you know, mixing. Uh, you know, you go to class, you come out of class, and you go back to your dormitory, your you know, your group, uh, you know, and and that was it. Um, Were the groups defined by race? Or absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did not feel uh, comfortable in, um, you know, I wasn't looking for a, you know, a white group to, you know, become uh, a member of, to socialize with. Um, I was, I wanted to stay in my comfort zone, which was my buddies and then uh, the other uh, blacks that were on campus. And there weren't many, you know, we're in an environment with 25,000 plus uh, students. And when we first got there, um, I think there were only 200 black students out of that. And um, there were only 50 black engineering students. And 25 of them were freshmen. And, you know, only five of them were expected to make it, you know, to the next year. And yet, you know, we retained 80%. Yeah. So, um, you know, as a student, it's really easy to say, oh, yes, we succeeded. We just went through the program. They couldn't stop us, right? Really easy to say that and feed into that overconfidence that we had to begin with. But the reality of the fact is that we didn't attend uh Purdue University in a vacuum, there were people who um, were supporters. Mm -hmm. And primary among them was a PhD student, PhD candidate named Arthur J. Bond. Um, And he had been appointed as the uh, director, um, he was the coordinator. His title was coordinator of programs for disadvantaged students in the school of uh, schools of engineering. And you know, we didn't know. We were just eighteen years old. We didn't know what he was doing, what he was dealing with. But um, first of all, this is one of the most educated black men in America at that time. When he when he did get his PhD, he told me he was, uh, you know, among the first twenty five to be awarded a PhD in engineering in the history of our country. Um, so because of what he was able to do, um, he had the ear of the administration at Purdue University. Um, he, had, he was a very persuasive man. He was able to convince them um, that we, meaning, you know, young blacks, freshmen coming through, that we could succeed. And we proved him right. Um, um, so he had influence just because of his education level. Um, 
and uh, his responsibility, and he was talking to the university. Um, but he had influence on us because I had never met any engineer whatsoever before I came to Purdue University. Not black, not white, not any ethnicity. I had never met an engineer in my life, and yet here I am. And I didn't even, I thought I was going to be an electrician. <laughs> you know, <laughs> here I am going to uh, study engineering. And I knew what, would, what the environment was like. I knew that uh, uh, people didn't expect us to succeed, but that didn't matter. Those rules uh, did not apply to me, and it didn't, didn't apply to my peers. Um, and I recall that Dr. Bond set up a program called the Counselor Tutorial Program. That was your first class of the day, every day. Um, it was him and Dr. Bill LeBold, uh, and there was another instructor. Uh, and the whole f purpose of that was basically it was a pep talk every morning uh, and an opportunity to help you with any homework to you. So you were expected to bring your homework to class. Uh, and if you had any questions about it, then you know that was your opportunity to get those questions answered. That Arbonne set up that program, okay? That was his brainchild, he implemented it. Um, he also set up um, a program called Counselor, uh, no, called uh, Top Five Junior, Pro Junior and Sophomore Program. So it was a recruiting program where he would go into high schools or he would invite high school students up so that they could see what you know the engineering opportunity was. Our, our Dr. Bond was very persuasive. Um, uh, you know, he was he could go into a barber shop and bring an engineer out. Okay, <laughs> this is what his personality was like, uh, and he was totally dedicated to this you know this theme of uh, recruiting more and helping us uh, to succeed in engineering. He believed in us, you know, and I think uh, the fact that he believed in us was a you know, great contributing factor to our own self-belief. Um, so, you know, the environment in, in the first year uh, was, it was great because your freshman engineering, all the engineers take the same classes, right? And then you go off into your your specific discipline. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I was the only one to go into double E. The others went into mechanical or civil engineering. So they were still, you know, together. And yet I felt like, uh oh, I'm out by myself. I can't, you know, talk about my electrical engineering homework with these other guys, whereas they could talk about their mechanical, they could talk about their civil homework. You know, I was on my, on my own in, in that regard once I got into my, my school. But I had a strategy of my own. And, uh, you know, for me, what I noticed is that there were some older black students, when I say older, I don't mean significantly older, they may be four years older, um, who were military veterans, some cases they were still in the military. So you might see them uh, you know, on campus wearing their uh, military uniform. Uh, but there was, a f there, were, uh, there was a fellow from the Air Force, a fellow from the Navy, and a fellow from the Marine. Those three guys, uh, they were not struggling in double E school. And so I decided that, you know, I would put myself, I volunteered to, to be mentored by them, okay? <laughs> um, so the other, the other thing that uh, is interesting about the very first electrical engineering class that I took, it was very interesting because it was a challenging, it was a big challenge to me. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I was really worried if I would be able to do this. You know, the math and the chemistry and the physics that we had in freshman engineering, that was, you know, sort of, you know, harder. But, you know, I was somewhat familiar with that because of high school prep. But this electrical engineering, these concepts, that was totally different to me. Um, 
And so I remember going to the professor um, before the first electrical engineering class, before, before the first test, mm -hmm. and I said, I have no idea what's going on, um, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he helped me. You know, I got some one-on-one -on -one, um, tutoring, if you will, um, mentorship, if you will, whatever the case may be. He answered my questions. Uh, and so then I, I felt like I understood that material fairly well. Do you remember his name? I do not remember his name. Um, but, you know, you, you know, our student at Purdue, you know how large the lecture halls are. Mm -hmm. And in your you know, freshman and sophomore years, they're uh, the largest because you got more students in, in those classes. So here I am sitting in, you know, in this classroom. You know, I'm going to speculate there may have been a thousand, certainly more than 500, more than 500 in this classroom. Um, you know, and maybe there's one, two, you know, electric, black electrical engineers in this class. Mm -hmm. um, so we had this first test. My hands are sweating. My palms are sweating. I take the test. Um, and then the, uh, the teacher comes back, you know, when we, when after the, the tests are graded, and he says, well, we have a problem because there's only two students that didn't fail this test. So the whole class, with the exception of those two students, are going to have to take this test over. And so I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, I did bad on it, so at least I'm not the only one, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I have more time to study up this material, and maybe I'll do better the next time I take it. I'm one of the two that didn't have to take the test again. Now, quite frankly, you know, I already told you I was overconfident. I'd have been better off if I failed that test. I was overconfident, so, um, you know, I found out I'm one of the two that got an A on this test. I got this, <laughs> okay? You know, for those who can't see, I have my hands behind my head, rock back in my chair, look around the room and, you know, survey the room, all these kids who are not as smart as I am, okay? And they thought they were smarter. I'd been better off if I failed the test because um, I didn't bring my A game, you know, back the rest of the semester. I said, oh, you know, this is, <laughs> I've got it, no problem. Um, you know, so I'm, I may have gotten a B at, it may be minus at the end of that class, whatever. I may have gotten a C plus. I really don't remember what my grade was in that class. Um, but, you know, it was at that point uh, that I was started to struggle, uh, and, you know, to maintain, you know, the grades that I had, you know, established. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but in our freshman year, all of my buddies and I, we had V averages. Okay, so we think, oh, we just move right through this just like we did through high school. Well, it became clear that that wasn't going to happen so easily uh, in the School of Electrical Engineering. Um, and I'd say it took me uh, another three semesters, you know, by the time I got to my junior year before I really buckled down and realized how hard I was actually going to have to work to, you know, to be competent in uh, this technology that I was studying. Um, you know, I've heard about this sophomore slump phenomenon that happens in education across the board. Well, I was definitely a part of, you know, the sophomore slump. Um, so there was an important thing that I learned uh, about people in general um, during that period you know, sort of my period going into a slump, you know, a great slump and coming out of it. Um, and, you know, I, I felt like these other students, predominantly white students, don't want me here. But I didn't know them. I didn't know them. How, how, how do I know if they wanted me there or not? I didn't know them, okay? Um, 
I just made assumptions that they didn't want me there. Um, I didn't understand. They didn't understand them. They didn't understand me. So, you know, we didn't speak, a, you know, sort of a common language from that standpoint, cult, common cultural lang language. So I understood that. But uh, what I learned about people that uh, continue with me for the rest of my life, the rest of my career certainly, is that if people believe that you have something valuable to contribute, you're in. Mm. You can break into that crowd, the in crowd, whatever that in crowd is. You can break into that crowd, whether it's an academic in crowd or a social in crowd. If they believe you have something to contribute, you can break in. And so what happened in my case is after getting tired of struggling coming into the junior year, I decided that I was going to treat the first week of class like finals week. Okay? And I decided that I was going to meet that group of guys who appeared to be the know-it-alls in, in our class. They would stand out in front of, uh, you know, the... Uh, lecture hall before class and they would compare each other's answers to homework before they would turn it in. And I remember initially uh, I would try to come up and look over their shoulders and try to listen in and hear what they were saying to see if I could, you know, check my answers. And just imagine a circle of, of guys and they saw me coming close to listen in and that circle tightened up. That circle tightened up to the point where all of those shoulders locked. Mm -hmm. And there was no way for me to, you know, to get in there and hear and, you know, and see what they were talking about. And this is a group of white this, students. This is a group of white class. students who they appeared to be top students. I don't know. They, they appeared to know what they were talking about. I don't know if they <laughs> did or not, really, okay? But yeah. they appeared to be. And so I thought, oh, you know, initially, oh, they're probably freezing me out because I'm black. No. That wasn't the reason. It's because they didn't think I had anything valuable to contribute to the group. So anyway, um, I come to this uh, in this this first semester of the junior year. I come to the table after having treated that first night of class when the homework was first assigned as a finals prep night. Uh, I came to class. I had all the answers to the homework. I knew my answers were correct. And so when these guys, uh, you know, sat out and stood out in front of the classroom talking about sharing, comparing notes, um, I yelled out when they, you know, because they'd go through the class uh, homework sequentially, question number one, two, three, four. So when that first, as soon as the first question uh, was brought up, I yelled out the answer. Now, I, you know, they see me there. I'm, my, I'm being blocked out. Um, and then they, they come up with the second one. I yelled out the answer. The third one yelled out the answer. So I had, you know, the right answer each time. And I said it with a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so the phenomenon that happened is those shoulders that were tightly locked in that circle opened up. And they made room for me. Okay? And so I was in with that, that electrical engineering in crowd from that point on for one reason. Because I had something to contribute. Something of value to contribute. Mm -hmm. So that taught me a, a lifelong lesson. And because, you know, if you come from an all-black environment, you come into a predominantly white environment, um, you know, the same situation exists when you go into the corporate world. You, you're once again, and, and, and when you go into the corporate world, you don't have your buddies from high school anymore. You don't have that social network anymore, okay? Now you're really on your own when you go into the corporate network. Um, but I remembered, first of all, you know, I'm a Purdue engineer, okay? Purdue engineers, there's a reason, you know, you, you have to work. They won't let you out unless you know what you're doing, okay? 
And so I came in, uh, probably came in overconfident again into the workplace, my MO. Um, um, but I'll tell you that overconfidence um, is, you know, it's sort of a coat of armor because there are going to be a lot of people, and there were a lot of people, who had low expectations for you coming into that environment. Um, but I had that coat of armor, so their opinions and attitudes about that didn't matter. And in some cases, I realized that, you know, what I think they might be thinking uh, is just an assumption on my part. They may, may not be thinking that. Okay? So I learned those lessons at Purdue, and that helped me um, to achieve uh, when I went into the workplace. And uh, so when I look at my career, I look at uh, what happened at Purdue, the you know, electrical engineering diploma, you know, that was, you know, that was my certificate of achievement. Um, well, when I was in the workplace, it's a different environment. Where do you get your certificate of achievement? You don't get a diploma when you are in the workplace. You get a paycheck, and you might get a raise, and you might get promoted. These are your certificates of achievement. Um, I did not have confidence that the people that I worked for uh, would fully appreciate my greatness. <laughs> and uh, so I really didn't have confidence that I would get the raises that I felt I had earned or the promotions that I felt I had earned. Um, and so I was, you know, I was very cautious going into the workplace. Um, and finally, after going through my, you know, early phase of my career, I went, I worked for General Electric in, uh, as a manufacturing engineer um, for a year, and then I decided I wanted to uh, work for Hewlett Packard. The GE job was in Cleveland, I'm from Chicago, I wanted to get back to Chicago. Also decided that I wanted to go into technical sales. Uh, I saw this engineering, manufacturing lifestyle that I had in the Midwest going into the plant before sunrise, coming out after sunset, uh, never seeing the sun. And then I was in a, uh, a, a, a meeting with product marketers. Marketing guys came in. Uh, they were wearing nice, fresh suits, and I heard they had company cars. And um, this one fellow had sunglasses in his pocket. And I'm thinking, I haven't seen sun in months except on the weekends, and this guy has a job where he has sunglasses in his pocket. And I decided right there in that meeting that that was the job for me. Mm -hmm. You know, comes along with a company car. You give you a territory. You can, you know, you're able to manage your own territory. The objective is to exceed your quota, exceed your uh, your sales quota, and if you do that, you give yourself a raise. That was my attitude about it. You know, I have to take control over this situation. I give myself a raise because I'm going to blow, you know, the doors. I have this, you know, where's all this confidence coming from? You had, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm going to blow the doors off of this quota. And then it was a, you know, it was a shocking reality, just like the shocking reality that I faced, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to be successful at Purdue. You know, you don't have overnight success when you're trying to move forward and learn something new that's difficult and challenging. Um, I had to learn these products. I was working for Hewlett Packard in an environment where they only hired electrical engineers to serve as uh, field engineers and calling on customers. We were calling on research and development uh, engineers. Um, and what I discovered is I was talking to similar profile people of the instructors that I had when I was at Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it was interesting, when I was at Purdue, there were many instructors in electrical engineers that in electrical engineering that had heavy foreign accents, many instructors. And I had no idea what they were saying. Um, and I even called my mother and said, I don't know if I can make it. Because I don't, first of all, I don't understand, I don't understand the book, I don't understand the teacher, you know. <laughs> and so my mother said, uh, go sit in the front row and put on your glasses. Click. <laughs> and so that's exactly what I did. Um, and sitting in the front row, um, I was paying very close attention to what these instructors were saying, and I was able to break the code on their accents because I was paying very close attention. Now, that was a skill set that served me well when I became a technical sales rep calling on R&D engineers, masters, and PhDs in engineering. They had the same accents, okay, um, calling on people at Bell Labs and, you know, Motorola, and Kodak, and, you know, all these different research labs, Allen Bradley, uh, all these different places. Um, and so there were times uh, when I might have been in a, in a meeting with two or three other HP um, field representatives and two or three um, engineers from the client. Um, there were times when I was sitting in that room, and because of those heavy accents, I was the only one in the room who understood what these engineers were saying. You know, and this happened in instances where I had, uh, in some cases, you know, two or three levels of management uh, in in these rooms. These were, you know, high level uh, discussions with uh, millions of dollars of opportunity, you know, to sell uh, state of the art electronic components. Uh, and because of my ability to understand them they were communicating with me. You know, this was an environment where uh, you bring in your big guns from the factory, you know, the, the, you know, the real experts uh, in the technology, the people who live and breathe the technology in the lab every day. You're bringing them in, you know, and, and putting them across the table from these high-level research and development engineers at Bell Labs, for example. Um, and they couldn't contribute because they didn't know what these folks were saying. I was the only one in many cases who understood. And so as a result, these engineers in the R&D lab, were, they were talking to me. And there was a great deal of respect that I was able to develop not only with the customers uh, because of that rapport I was able to build up with them, but also my management team saw, you know, the way I was able to build rapport with these folks. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an environment when I first started at Hewlett Packard in that role where there were low expectations. Uh, you know, no one expected me to succeed the way I did while I was there. I guess uh, uh, only me and the guy who hired me expected me to be able to do that. But I was getting, you know, a lot of... Um, you know, nonverbal feedback uh, from people that, you know, what you have to say, you're just a rookie, you don't have, you know, you don't know what you're doing and you probably never will, <laughs> okay? Nonverbal feedback, okay? Um, but anyway, I became a top salesman, you know, in some cases broke sales records, um, and eventually I was promoted to district manager, and I took, you know, a team of sort of, you know, newbies to misfits uh, and on my team to become the top uh, district in the United States. And so that diploma that I was seeking in, in, the, in the workplace came in 1989 when I was awarded, at, 19, at the end of 88, when I was awarded the uh, uh, Hewlett Packard President's Club Award. Uh, which is the top honor that you can get. And um, you know, so you can think about the fact that there are salespeople, field engineers that get that award, 
and there are a magnitude fewer district managers that get that award because, you know, there's just fewer of them. So I got this recognition um, and, you know, came with the perks of having my wife and I fly out to this great, you know, award ceremony. And uh, that award was presented to me by both Hewlett, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, and John Young, the CEO of the company at the time. So I have this picture uh, of me getting this award from them. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only black person that ever got that. Uh, Hewlett and Packard, you know, at that point, they were celebrating a 50th anniversary they were soon to be retired, um, and so you know I'm very, very proud of of, of that honor that I received from Hewlett Packard, and it showed that you know this kid from the South Side of Chicago um, was able to achieve at every level, you know, achieved at the high school level, at the college level, and you know now in the pros. So to me, you know, analogous to the uh, basketball career that I never had. I was an all-star. Yeah, there you go. At HP. An all-star just in a different field. <laughs> a different field, yes, yes. Well, that's wonderful. And it's Trump. interesting how you like made that connection in terms of the things you were learning in the Purdue classroom that then translated. <laughs> oh, the yes. The initiative you were taking. Oh, yes. In mm -hmm. fact, um, when I became, you know, you, you, you get promoted in sales because you were the top, you know, sales guy. But then you become a manager and there's different skills that you have to use to uh, develop your people and, and, you know, help them become the best they can be. And I discovered, you know, those skills that I needed, I already knew them because, you know, because of my leadership that I had developed you know, not just at Purdue, but, uh, you know, from the Boy Scouts on up. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, so we had a lot of fun in, in, in my sales district. We had a lot of fun. Um, we, we established, I remember I told you before, I believe in 100% success. Mm -hmm. So we established what we call uh, the 550 Club. I had five reps on my team. Uh, the goal was for every one of them to make 110% of quota minimum. And so we decided to be cute to call ourselves because of five reps, 110%, the 550 club. <laughs> uh, and we went to the point where we even had HP logo hats with 550 club on it. Um, and everyone was successful. And w what I did is the same thing that we had done in, in Nesby, everyone helping one another. And so I had this group of, of, you know, five guys, and they each had different strengths. You know, some of them had strengths I didn't have. I had strengths that some of them didn't have, okay? But I was able to recognize the, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of everybody on my team, including me. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we had any sort of a challenge, be it a technical challenge or be it a negotiation challenge, I knew who had the skills to help. And so we started working together. And so that notion of, you know, 110%, everyone bought in because everyone was getting help from someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we were really, really proud of the fact that we were able to achieve that. You know, and that, that camaraderie that we developed is a total uh, outgrowth of the same kind of camaraderie that I had, uh, you know, when I worked with the Society of Black Engineers and then the National Society of Black Engineers. Mm -hmm. So how did you first get involved with the Society of Black Engineers? Like before it was a national organization that produced. Can we take a break? Yeah. And then we'll come back and answer that. Okay, so how do I how did I become involved in the Society of Black Engineers? The Society of Black Engineers was the brainchild of a student who was a senior named Ed Barnett. Uh, Ed Barnett was, quote unquote, the big man on campus. He was the leader of the uh, Cap Alpha Psi fraternity. Um, and, you know, he was this senior who was, you know, soon to graduate with this industrial engineering degree. Um, 
And he later said in a video before he passed that he felt that the seniors had an obligation to the underclassmen to help them. Uh, and that's what was his intent for starting at the time. He called it the Black Society of Engineers. Um, but he had a big challenge on his hands because the university did not want to recognize um, his group as a separate organization. He figured there were plenty of, they figured there were plenty of other organizations on campus. Um, but Ed Barnett was a very uh, persuasive and very um, persistent young man. Mm -hmm. And so he kept coming back. And, you know, and making another case, trying to get this organization established. Um, but he also said in a video that's actually on the architect of, of uh, Nesby's page, Dr. Bond's page, he said that um, uh, it wasn't until Dr. Bond agreed to be the faculty advisor that the university said, okay, we'll go ahead and recognize this organization. So Dr. Bond was, you know, the great enabler of, of that, the Black Society of Engineers, um, just because of his presence and his influence in the university. Um, and he was the guy who wrote the initial uh, constitution for organization. Uh, and he benchmarked the constitutions of the University of Michigan, there was a uh, Society of Black Engineers there, and he also benchmarked the Constitution for the Society of Women Engineers. Uh, many people don't know, but uh, the Society of Women Engineers was founded in 1955, 20 years before the Society of Black, the National Society of Black Engineers. I have no idea, you know, how long the SWE chapter was established at uh, Purdue University. But, you know, so it's fair to say that they had a head start and, uh, you know, their model was one that we benchmarked against uh, as we, you know, built the Society of Black Engineers and, and moved forward. In fact, we initially, we had uh, joint uh, events with the Society of Women Engineers. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it, it gave us an opportunity to have an audience with the same corporate people that were coming to recruit the Society of Women Engineers. They were, you know, they were getting two for one. They were getting the black engineers and the Society of Women Engineers when they came to our events. Um, but, so Ed Barnett decides that uh, he wants to start this organization. Uh, he's able to start it, and he calls the... Uh, the engineers who were on campus at the time. Well, you know, the, the underclassmen were us. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, most of the sophomores uh, had flunked out. Okay, so, you know, the, the majority of the recruits for this new society was our freshman class. Um, and then, you know, our, our, our group, our crew, uh, was naturally, uh, you know, the focal point, you know, the leaders of that organization because we were already a functioning team, if you will. Um, and so um, Ed Barnett was the president and, you know, started just giving us advice on, you know, what we should be trying to do to uh, have a successful college engineering career. Um, and more than anything else, it was uh, a feeling that there was someone who cared, uh, someone who understood the, you know, the challenge that you were dealing with. Um, and um, there were other people who were rooting for you to succeed. Okay, Th those are big parts of, of what the society of... Uh, um, black engineers was about, um, you know, and when I try to help people understand, you know, the kind of culture that uh, we developed that still exists today, 
You know, it's, it's easy for me to illustrate when I talk about, uh, think about uh, when you're watching a basketball game on TV and someone falls to the floor um, and the teammates rush over there. Sometimes they're rushing to see who can get there first to lend a hand and help that teammate get up off the ground. Anybody who's watched a professional basketball game or a college basketball game, they've seen that, okay? Um, that's the environment that we had in, in, and we still have today in our team. It's an encouraging environment. Uh, if you fall and scrape your knee, you've got a lot of different people who are rushing over to try to help you up and help you get back on track, okay? Um, and then the whole notion of having a role model. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had no black engineering role model whatsoever until I got to Purdue University, and that first guy was Dr. Arthur Bond. And, the, you know, the, the, the second guy uh, was Eric Harris, who was the, the fellow that I followed to college. Um, and then, you know, the third guy, because of his personality, was uh, Ed Barnett. So, um, you know, as a society of black engineers, as we matured uh, and became upperclassmen ourselves, um, people were drawn to us. And uh, part of the reason is because of our personalities. But the other, other reason is that uh, when, you, when you start having internship jobs and you're making more money than people have ever seen and you come back on campus and somehow some way you 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 were able to pay your tuition and you're driving a new car okay this was our experience um, and so you had you know younger engineering students that were looking at us saying hey you know what <laughs> this really could pay off um, and so I've talked to some of them that you know went on and graduated and had stellar engineering careers of their own uh, and they told me that it was really important for them to see us graduate. Um, you know, and, and I talked to um, one guy in particular, Jerry Perkins, who was, he was struggling, admittedly struggling in the first couple of years. But he said that, you know, he turned it up and he started studying more. Uh, and, you know, he started getting A's in his engineering classes. Um, and he had a buddy, his roommate, James White, um, and they would, they would make a bet every year who was going to have the highest uh, GPA for, for the semester, you know. And so they just started working together. And, you know, there's, there, there were a couple of students who were really, really well prepared for college and were, you know, doing excellent, had excellent grades. Um, and, and they were helping the students that weren't so well prepared, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And so that's why people have developed such a love for Nesby is because, you know, it's, it's a home away from home, you know. And, and to me, it's, it's like an oasis. I've described it as an oasis. You know, if, I, if, 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 I send, if my, my grandson goes off to college, I want him to, you know, come to an environment like that, which has been created by Nesby to help him be successful. So um, the interesting thing about what we were doing in the, the Society of Black Engineers is we were basically just trying to, to be successful. So we split up into various uh, committees. We had a you know, tutorial committee. Ed Coleman was responsible for that. Um, we had a special projects committee, and that was Brian Harris responsible for that. Um, you know, we had John Logan, our vice president, and, you know, I, I always refer to him as our best engineer, okay? Um, and he just had all the, all the tools. In baseball, they talk about a five-tool player, you know. Uh, John Logan was that guy. Uh, um, and he, can, he could sub for anybody, and, you know, without missing a beat. Um, you know, I was a publications chair, and my job was, you know, to document um, our activities. 
um, you know, and to come up with the, you know, the best way to represent what we, who we were. Um, um, Dr. Arthur Bond set me in motion uh, once I became publication chair to develop the our first recruiting brochure. You know, I was I thought I was going to develop some newsletters, mm -hmm. uh, but he said, "Look, I need a recruiting brochure." So I I dived in on that. Um, I had never developed any sort of a brochure like that before, so I benchmarked. Uh, Jet, Mag Jet Magazine, published by the Johnson Publish Publishing Company. Um, and if you look at uh, a 19, early 70s format for Jet Magazine and you f compare it to ours, um, our recruiting brochure, it was all there. It was, the, you know, it was a, a similar format. And so basically, it was a way to uh, invite other black engineering or black high school students to come to Purdue specifically and to join with us uh, because you know we're making things happen here. Um, we're gonna we we are successful in, in engineering school and we're gonna graduate and we can show you how. Um, you know, and we should first showed you here's how you need to prepare. We actually told them what classes that you need to take to be eligible for uh, engineering at Purdue. Um, and we told them about, you know, what some of the opportunities were. And, you know, and I had to write an article on uh, co-op engineering, you know, the co-op internship program. That was what I participated in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was why, you know, my education was on a five-year plan because I was, you know, going into General Motors for a semester at a time, sometimes a summer and a semester and working in manufacturing or working in research and development, you know, doing tests uh, in, you know, engineering. So when we would come back to campus, you know, we'd tell these younger students what, are, uh, what our experiences were. Um, and uh, we had meetings where we invited corporate representatives to come to us and tell us about the opportunities at their companies. Um, John Logan was the the one who was inviting these corporations, um, and so we set up a calendar in our in our Cornerstone newsletter, which was our second publication. Um, you know, there's actually a calendar in there that shows exactly what we were doing. We had one of the Purdue professors speak to us. Uh, we had a couple of uh, corporate representatives speak to us. We listed uh, Art Bonds. Uh, uh, top five junior and sophomore program, you know, to attract high school students, um, you know, and we we talked about what we were what we were achieving at the time, um, and we talked about what our future plans were, you know, in that very first cornerstone, uh, in a, in a little editorial that I wrote, we we announced through that editorial that we intended to start a National Society of Black Engineers. Mm -hmm. And we knew that what we were doing was significant. We knew it was groundbreaking. Um, uh, and so, you know, the question has been asked, you know, how did, how did you decide to do this? Uh, and there's different stories you're going to hear from different guys, okay? Uh, but my earliest recollection of how this you know, the, the, the seed for this whole notion of going from the local Purdue chapter to a national uh, happened when we came back to uh, Chicago on break. First of all, we went to a technical high school, a big technical high school. We had over 500 students in our graduating class. This and was this was Lindblom High School. They were all prepared. They took the same classes that we took. They all had basically gone through a pre-engineering curriculum. They, we had a lot of uh, engineers. Um, and so they were in engineering school the same time as us. We'd come back, we'd meet and go to you know parties during the summertime and, and what have you. Um, and I can recall one of our classmates, Michael Joshua, who was at, uh, he was majoring in mechanical engineering at the University of Missouri, Rolla. Um, and we were telling him about our organization, and Michael Joshua said, man, 
I wish we had something like that on my campus. And my memory tells me that I said, we're going to take this thing national. That's my first memory of, uh, you know, the, the notion of establishing a national society of black engineers, you know. And so what I recognized during that conversation was that there was a need on these other campuses the same way there was a need on our campus. And, uh, and you know, something like this, like what has happened with the National Society of Black en Engineers, that happens because there's a need and, you know, because some, someone found a way to fulfill that need. So that's the, uh, you know, the story of sort of the, you know, the inspiration and motivation. Uh, but how we actually pulled it out off, first of all, we had Dr. Bond. Dr. Bond actually uh, hired a person to help him because keep in mind, he was teaching electrical engineering classes and he was, you know, coaching us. So he had two full-time jobs. Um, he, he slept very little. <laughs> I, so we've learned from his, his wife. But he hired a lady named uh, Sonny Taylor. She may have already had her PhD when she joined his team. But her, her job was to help support this, you know, this program that he was responsible for that was the precursor of the uh, minority engineering programs that, you know, that you hear about. Um, and so she did a lot of the back office work to help us, you know, to, you know, pull off what we were trying to organize. Um, but the way we achieved that was basically dividing up tasks. Um, and then the, the great thing about our group is that we could count on each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone was uh, responsible and everyone, you know, was accountable. And so everyone delivered. So if we needed a, uh, a mailing list, then, you know, someone would step up and get it. Uh, that was one of the things that, that I was responsible for. Um, now, as far as, you know, how this thing was, you know, came together as a, a national organization, there were a lot of people involved. Uh, there was a gentleman who was also supporting us named Thomas Fletcher. Um, and he worked in the administration. I'm not sure exactly what his job was, but um, he was you know, in engineering education administration in some way. But the reality is that uh, he uh, and Dr. Bond, they attended engineering education conferences. And when they would go to those, there were uh, representatives from these other colleges. Okay, and so the black folks from these other colleges that would go to these conferences, they naturally would introduce themselves to one another. Okay. So Thomas Fletcher had a list of these colleagues that had similar roles to him uh, on these other college campuses. So Dr. Bond told me to go and get, you know, Thomas Fletcher's list of contacts. Okay. So when we sent the letter out, it wasn't just a, a you know, a blind letter uh, going out to people that had no idea, you know, who we were. There were phone calls being made uh, on our behalf, uh, Thomas Fletcher in particular, you know, to let people know that, look, you're going to, you know, you're going to get a letter and this is what, what these kids are trying to do here and we support them, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so that's, you know, what was happening at Purdue University. But, you know, Purdue University wasn't operating in a vacuum. Um, the challenges that we had at our university were happening at all these other universities, and it was recognized uh, by the National Academy of Engineering. Um, for those who have never heard of the National Academy of Engineering, their role is to provide advice to the United States government on uh, ad ad advice on the best way to... Uh, promote engineering, both the education and the profession in our country. Uh, and uh, along with the Sloan Foundation, 
And for those who've never heard of the Sloan Foundation, this was a foundation um, that was funded by the fortune of Alfred P. Sloan, who was a longtime uh, president and CEO of General Motors. You know, he was kind of the Bill Gates of his time. He set up this Sloan Foundation, and the Sloan they had a they had a charter to go out and try to you know improve American society, and with that they had a lot of money to back it up, and the Sloan Foundation challenged the National Academy of Engineering to do something to improve the uh, retention and success rates of minorities in engineering, and at the time minorities in engineering were uh, considered blacks. Um, uh, Mexican or you know Latino background and Native American Indians. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so with that challenge, the National Academy of Engineering's response um, is actually documented in a book called Minority. I've got it right here. The title of the book is Minorities in Engineering, A Blueprint for Action, a report on the Planning Commission for Expanding Minority Opportunities in Engineering. So this was published in 1974. Okay, and the timing is very significant. Um, The nation's top engineering schools as well as the leading corp- the leaders from the leading corporations met. The corporations needed more engineers. The same way they, they need engineers and technology people now, they, they anticipated the greater need for that then. Uh, they met and they made an agreement that uh, the goal should be to increase the minority engineering population tenfold. Okay, and in, here, in this book, they establish that you know when you when you do the math and calculate the percentages, there were um, 850 black engineers graduating uh, every every year in the time frame that this book was written, and so their goal to increase that tenfold meant that in 10 years they wanted to see 8,500 black engineers graduate. That's an aggressive goal. You know, we're talking about almost 50 years later, and we're not even halfway to that goal, okay? Mm-hmm. Right now we have 3,500 being, you know, graduating. Uh, but the point is, and you know, this Blueprint for Action, they, they brainstorm a lot of different, uh, you know, ways that they could support. This notion of retaining engineers is not new. Okay, because there is a challenge retaining engineers among the you know the widespread engineering population, not just the niche of minorities, and so um, you know so they 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 discuss that in here, um, and bottom line is that they developed a list of uh, characteristics that they thought would be important for um, uh, for improving the. Uh, success rate of minorities in engineering. And tops on that list was a student organization to support minority engineers. Okay? And so this was in 1974. They distributed this report. So this report's going out to universities all over the country. It's going out to corporations. Okay? And then a year later, we send a letter saying, look, we want to start a National Society of Black Engineers. Now, uh, you, someone's going to have a hard time convincing me that those dots are not connected, that uh, our idea to start a National Society was not directly linked to a national initiative, and we helped to facilitate for them. Okay? Um, and so the need was well recognized, um, and the success rate of people, the students who participate in the National Society of Black Engineers is higher than the students who elect not to participate. It's a voluntary organization, you know. Um, and I saw a, uh, a statistic in an article that I read recently, can't cite the source, but it said that the students that, you know, actively participate in NSBE have... Uh, 
grades and retention levels that match the you know the engineering student population as a whole Mm -hmm. so that right there tells me you know that we have you know the you know that tells me why we've continued to be uh an organization for all these years to the point now where you know we have tens of thousands of members um and we have a goal to get to 10,000 graduates uh, by, I think it's 2025. Uh, you know, and you know, from my perspective, that's great. Uh, we want to have, we want to go from 3,500 a year to 10,000 a year, uh, but we also want to go from 3,500 jobs to 10,000 jobs. If we have 10,000 engineers and only 3,500 jobs, that's a problem. Okay. To make all that happen, we have to have more acceptances. Okay, to make all that happen, we have to increase, continue to increase the retention level. And you know, we've got to start preparing kids, you know, as early as the age of my grandson, eight years old, so that they get on that track. Mm-hmm. You know, and these are the things that the, the National Society of Black Engineers is doing right now. Um, but like in the past, we're going to need help from the universities. We're going to need help from uh, from the corporations as a whole. Um, and, you know, people need to be reminded that uh, the students who get their engineering degrees that come from NSBE, they go off and they have excellent careers in their corporations. Um, we know we've got 50 years of history, you know. And so I know uh, many people who are my age who went to engineering school and, you know, and they went into the corporate world and, you know, and they proved themselves. They made great contributions. Um, you know, it's not widely publicized. Uh, you know, very few people would know that, and I, you know, I was honored to be the President's Club representative uh, for Hewlett Packard. And that was, you know, first of his kind, may still be the only one who achieved that, okay? Uh, But there's more to follow. Uh, And as far as I'm concerned, one thing that's really important um, is to increase the role model exposure. You know, know, I, I said earlier that I didn't have any engineering role models until I met Dr. Bond. Well, you've got an environment now where Nesby's holding seat camps, summer engineering experience for kids, kids who have completed the third grade all the way up into, uh, you know, before they enter elementary school. These kids have uh, Nesby engineering students that are training them on engineering concepts and engine, doing engineering projects and these kids learn a ton during those sessions, uh, and they're excited about participating. And I, you know, I've already sort of, uh, you know, rolled out this notion for my grandson. He said, "Well, what do they? What do they do, Grandpa?" I said, "They go there and they make their own toys." And I said, "Oh yeah, that's what I want to do. When can I get in?" You know what I mean? So you, the whole idea is to get the kids excited about it so that uh, we can have more of the great engineering discoveries that uh, happen as a result of the intellectual power coming from uh, uh, minorities in engineering. Uh, And, you know, it's it's very, very, not very well known uh, that there are many black engineers, black physicists, black chemists, that have been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, now, you know, I've looked at the invent.org website. You can't just go there and, and uh, you know, try to do a search for blacks in energy. You've got to go page by page, year by year, nominee by the nominee, uh, by the alphabet. They're all listed alphabetically. You've got to go there and click on it and look at it and see, and sometimes they may be black and you don't know it, okay? Mm-hmm. So you've got to read the resume. Um, but it's just incredible, all the uh, accomplishments that uh, our, uh, many of our black engineers have made. 
you know, I mentioned to you uh, in our earlier conversation about David Crossway. Got a BS in mechanical engineering in 1913. Uh, and then by 1920, he had a master's in mechanical engineering from Purdue University. Uh, if you look at his birth date and you discover he was 15 years old when he uh, got his BS degree. And then he goes on and uh, he's the owner holder of 30 U.S. patents and more than 80 foreign patents. Uh, and his field was heating and cooling of large buildings. So... Uh, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame because of his impact on his industry. He was writing uh, standards for heating and cooling of, of, uh, of uh, large buildings, uh, and they were published in the industry standards uh, that were used worldwide. He was setting worldwide standards for this, and it was at a time when most of the uh, heating and cooling was done through boilers. So anyone from uh, Purdue University, you know, I challenge you to find a greater boilermaker from our, uh, our history. But people don't know about this. You know, I wish I had known about him when I was in engineering school. Um, you know, I wish I had known that. I might have had a different uh, perspective on it. Um, it. I think that would have excited me. And so, you know, when I'm talking to students now, these are the kind of things that I talk to them about. And there's a there's a great need. You know, we, every year we have Black History Month, and you know I see what my grandson you know is talking about in school. He's going to a school that's predominantly white. They're talking about you know uh, the Underground Railroad and slavery. Okay, that's enough of that. That's my attitude about it. Uh, we're not going to forget that happened. That's not what we need to be covering in school because he's sitting there, maybe three or four out of twenty black kids. And everybody's looking at them like, okay, you you know, your great ancestors were slaves. Well, we also had bosses during that time. And if you look at the National uh, Inventors Hall of Fame at invent.org, you will find uh, that there was a gentleman named Thomas Jennings who was the first black person to be awarded a patent by the United States government. He's the inventor of a system called dry scouring, which is essentially dry cleaning. He invented the dry cleaning process. He was a master tailor, very successful businessman because of his tailoring business, and he became even more successful for because of this process that he developed to clean these expensive clothes that he was, uh, you know, tailoring for people in New York City. Um, and so, you know, in the National Inventors Hall of Fame, the only people they put in there are people who have had a who deemed to have had a major impact on uh, uh, our society, not just the United States, but society, but worldwide. Um, and so, you know, those are just a couple of examples of people. So, just think about the look on my grandson's face when, when you know, he was talking about. Uh, the Underground Railroad and Harry Tubman, et cetera. And I said, look, we had bosses back then too, okay? We had Thomas Jennings, who was a, an abolitionist, who was funding the Underground Railroad. Well, people don't know about that, you know? And so this is part of what's missing in our educational system. And everyone is a victim of not having uh, enough information about the contributions that we've made, so they think we haven't made any. OK, but if you do just a little bit of homework you nowadays because of the Internet, you know, you can find information that wouldn't have been accessible before. Uh, there, are, there are a great many contributions that have been made, technical contributions that have been made uh, by blacks in, in this country that have infected, impacted the, the world. Uh, and they were done at times when the conditions were so much more challenging than they are today. Uh, and they were sometimes done by people who did not have the advantage of the educational system. They were, you know, self-educated. So just think about it. If we had an educational system uh, that was level and, uh, uh, you know, met the needs of everyone in society. Um, and so, you know, my attitude is that everyone is a victim both the, the white students in the class 
uh, as well as the black students, because the white students, are, you know, they're set in motion and thinking um, that, uh, you know, we've, we haven't made these contributions that we've actually made. Uh, and the black students are thinking the same things. Um, and then they're surprised to find out that, you know, all these wonderful things that we have done. And it changes their perspective on what they're capable of. That's what it does. You know, now in every generation, you're going to have people that break through no matter what the challenge. But that's not what I'm, you know, that's not my theme. My theme is 100. I want everybody to be successful. And we're going to need an organization like the National Society of Black Engineers to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So with that theme of 100, and I guess you were thinking of that around the same time when the first conference happened and you were talking about the culmination of all these different factors from all your work as students, the Purdue faculty and staff who are assisting, and then the national environment. What was it like at that first national conference at Purdue? Oh, it was very exciting. It was, you know, really an incredible experience um, to see all these other students just like you had the same, you know, goals, objectives, dreams, uh, ability, um, and to, to see them all in one place at the same time. You know, you have a, a, a sense of being alone when you're just one or two uh, in, an, in an organization, be that organization a school or be that organization a, a company. Uh, but whenever you go to one of these uh, National Society of Black Engineers conferences, including the very first one, you have this sense of the, you know, this great intellectual power that we have that, you know, if harnessed and pointed in the right, the right direction, can do so much. So, um, you know, it was very encouraging. And then after going as I mentioned earlier, going off into the corporate world, uh, in my case, in, in the, the field that I chose, you know, in, uh, you know, in many cases, there might be one uh, black person in a department, one black person in a division, one black person in a corporation, okay? And in my industry that I selected, I felt like I was the only one in the entire industry because I didn't run into anybody else like me in the electronics industry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, despite, um, despite the, you know, perceived challenges, um, we had the opportunity to be successful. Um, and a Nesby conference to this day, um, it is the most e exciting thing that happens over the course of a year to see all these students because now you have a conference that's gone from, you know, 80 to 100, uh, maybe 150 with, when you include the, the Purdue students with the students that came in from outside our school, um, uh, going from a conference like that in the range of 100-ish to a conference in the range of 10,000-ish. Uh, it's just, you know, it just... It's very, very exciting and exhilarating, and you know it becomes clear. I've, I've talked to many um, engineers, engineering students, and every time I talk to them, I ask them, "Can you ask everyone in the room to raise their hand if you can think of at least two students that you, you know, went through elementary through high school with, who are not in college, who are not in engineering, but you know." deep down in your heart that those two students are smarter than you are. So every hand goes up when I ask that question, all right? So then this notion of, you know, do we think that we can, you know, that we have the potential to get to a number like 10,000 from 3,500, you know, through my non-scientific poll, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Three times 3,500, we can do it today. If we had the right mechanism, the right ec educational mechanisms in place. Mm -hmm. And then for those who may not be aware, um, the current mission of Nesby is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, 
succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. What are your thoughts on the current mission and sort of has it been transformed from when the national organization first started, that idea? Is it well articulated? Are there things that have been added on to that history? Okay, so um, being retired, I've had time to reflect on things that maybe uh, others haven't had a chance to think of because they're working. Um, but in my personal opinion, the greatest thing to happen to our organization, within our organization, was the articulation of that mission, word for word, just as you stated it. Okay? So, you know, I tip my hat to that team that uh, decided that these are the words that should represent our mission. Now, in, in, in my work as a business plan uh, mentor, um, every person who writes a business plan needs to establish a vision and a mission. Mm -hmm. And I use the National Society of Black Engineers mission statement as the objective, as the, um, you know, the benchmark, the goal. I say, if you can come up with a mission statement that states what you want to do, as well as the National Society of Black and Engineer, Engineers states their mission statement, then you'll have something that you can build on. So, uh, you know, I'm going to go on record right now that, in, in my opinion, the greatest thing to happen to our organization since its founding is the articulation of that, that mission statement. And I use it to this day. I use that mission statement when I'm thinking about, if I'm thinking about a presentation that I'm going to give, um, I try to make sure somewhere in that presentation I hit all of those points articulated in, in that mission statement. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look at my life. I look at my career, okay, and I use that as my measuring stick. Have I done everything that I needed to do with this education that I, that I earned from Purdue University. If I've done everything in that mission statement, if I'm still doing everything in that mission statement, then I'm on the right track. I get questions from students all the time, you know, what do you think we should be doing in the future? Go right back to that mission statement because they captured it. Now, my understanding is there's a gentleman named Gary May um, who has a very, very deep footprint in the growth of the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, I wouldn't be the, be the least bit surprised if Virginia Booth Walmack was in the room when, when they came up with that uh, mission statement. But, you know, to whoever was in the room when they came up with that, I, you know, from a founder, okay, I'm here to thank you for that mission statement. And while anyone can join NSBE, the name and mission does emphasize black engineers. What does the term black engineers mean to you? Well, um, black engineers is, is a, it's a racial identity. Uh, it's an underrepresented racial identity. Um, and I am proud to say that I'm black and an engineer. Um, and I am so happy that we chose the National Society of Black Engineers. Our names have, you know, changed from Negro to colored to black to African American, okay? Um, but I am so proud that and happy that we have the word National Society of Black Engineers in there. So, um... You know, the mission is as, as it states. We want to increase the numbers of black engineers. That's what it means to me. Uh, because if we can increase the number of, of people trained in engineering, we can not only make great contributions to the corporations that we work for, but we'll get paid. And we'll make great contributions to our own families. And we'll be great role models. All right. Everyone who gets an engineering, the black engineer who gets an engineering degree is a role model for their community, whether they know it or not. There are people who watch them get themselves educated. Uh, and there, there are people in church that are 
congratulating the parents of students who have engineering, de engineering degrees. Uh, there are people in church and in the neighborhood or who are looking at these kids that are getting these engineering degrees and they're telling their children that you need to be just like him or you need to be just like her. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they serve as the role model that I never saw. You know, and, and we need to be more active about that, that uh, uh, the promotion of that role that we have as black engineers in our community. Um, and we need to have a sense of urgency about it, okay? Because we need to solve this problem fast. I'm not a, I, yes, you can tell I'm not a patient man, okay? <laughs> we need to solve this problem fast, and this is the fastest vehicle that I've seen uh, to penetrate um, our culture. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that's just wonderful about engineering is that it teaches engineering. Not just teaches engineering, but is that it teaches teamwork. What I often say is uh, engineering is a team sport. And I think that's a big factor in the success of the National Society of Black Engineers because young students are learning how to get themselves organized and get things done, okay, and uh, accomplish tasks. You, this is what you have to do. In engineering school, we have labs that students have to take. And the, uh, in the labs, you have to have a lab partner. And so it's building in this whole notion of working in teams. In, in engineering school. And that translates into the, you know, professional societies that you join and contribute to, and it translates in when you get into the workplace. Whether you actually work as an engineer, quote unquote, in an engineering occupation that requires you to use the math and science skills on a daily basis, or if you're working in some sort of a, uh, a management responsibility. Those problem-solving skills are tra transferable, and you know, and that's what's going to move this society forward. Uh, you know, and we have a need that you know our it's it's not just a need of the black community. Our our entire culture, our entire society needs uh, engineering talent to compete with uh, societies in other countries. This is a great need, um, and you know the projections are that there are going to be enough jobs to go around for everybody, and we need to take advantage of it. Um, and you know, one of my pet peeves is this notion. I read an article that said thirty-nine percent of the parents of high school athletes think they're going pro. No, they're not going pro. But you come, you know, come with us in the National Society of Black and Engineers. You can go pro. Mm -hmm. You can go pro at some of the top corporations, and, and uh, one of these days we're going to have some engineers successful enough to go out and buy a sports team. Yep. And Dr. In the Purdue archives, there is some pictures from uh, the Nesby Torch dedication ceremony that yes. occurred at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about um, what that event was and the significance of it to you? Uh, well, it was a great day. Um, it was a family day. You know, not just the Nesby family, but our own immediate families. Um, so I had, uh, you know, my family, uh, I had uh, in-laws, uh, cousins, um, you know, there are a lot of people that uh, are, you know, invested in what they've seen is the success of the National Society of Black Engineers. And so, you know, it was a day of pride, um, you know, pride to be recognized at Purdue for being a part of the founding of what has become a flagship ship, uh, organization in our in our country, STEM related. Um, so it was it was really it was a day of joy. It was a reunion day, so we had an opportunity to you know to reunite with uh, students and faculty that you know were important mm -hmm. people who supported us. Um, 
You know, it was a great day to see Dr. Arthur Bond, who, you know, was our leader uh, and our role model. I call him the North Star for my career. Um, and, uh, and it was a great day to see the Dean of Engineering, um, you know, coming out to recognize uh, what this organization had become. And, you know, the bottom line is Purdue is proud of the fact that they are the only college that can say that, you know, students at our school founded the National Society of Black Engineers. Purdue is very proud of that. And we're, of course, proud, uh, you know, that we're Purdue engineers. What else do you think that Purdue could do in the current day to continue to support Nesby and black engineering students in general? Listen to Virginia Booth Walmack. Take her advice. Do what she, give her what she's asking for. That's what you can do. Uh, because she, you know, has been connected to this organization from the very beginning. She was there on the, the first day. Uh, of the, the the conference, she was she was a part of our team. She worked. She's she's the type of person that always is all in. Um, she was writing articles for our uh, Cornerstone newsletter while we were still there. She was the editor of the Cornerstone newsletter after we left. Uh, she's been a part of every important phase of the growth and development of the National Society of Black Engineers. She knows what she's talking about. Um, she has the confidence of students and the confidence of alumni. Um, and she's your, you know, you don't need to be looking for other advice from other experts, okay? You listen to what she says uh, and, and, you know, give her what she needs. back on things how you described it I'm not sure if you really can imagine this but how do you think your collegiate experience would be different if the Black Society of Engineers never became a reality well first of all um, you know like I said earlier I had an unfair advantage because I came to campus with all my best friends okay my best friends essentially you know we were the Society of Black Engineers that culture that, you know, is the Society of Black, National Society of Black Engineers is, you know, is our culture. It's, you know, it's a family. Um, so we had the supportive environment, um, and that contributed to our retention rate. Now, you know, I've often asked myself the question, what if I didn't, you know, go to Purdue? What if, what if I was like so many other students who went off to college and had to make new friends and, you know, also had to figure out what this, you know, what they needed to do to be successful in engineering without a mentor, okay? There's no way for me or any of my peers to prove that we wouldn't have been, you know, a similar statistic, you know, one of the people that flunked out now. You know, it's easy for us to say now because, you know, we made it, we're successful, et cetera, et cetera. It's very easy for us to say, oh, we would have made it no matter what the circumstances. I don't know if that's true. I know that's true for a guy like David Crosswaite, who graduated at 15 years old in 1913. Uh, I know that's true for him, okay? But I can't say for sure without, you know, a, a beyond a shadow of a doubt that I would have made it. Without my peers, I can't say for sure that I would have been able to make it without Dr. Bond. In fact, I've been on record to say that I don't believe I would have been an engineer if it weren't for Dr. Bond. Because there was on more than one occasion that I went to his office and I said, oh, look, you know what, I was, I was just about to tell him, I think I'm going to change my major. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I went into his office and, you know, he'd start to cajole you as soon as you walked in the office um, and you know before I know the meeting is over I'm walking out I'm you know I'm, I'm happy and laughing because of this conversation with it and I actually forgot to tell him I, my plan was to change majors okay so this is the you know this is the what I'm telling you this is what is the potential impact 
of someone who's operating in the minority engineering program director role. Mm -hmm. They are literally saving careers on a daily basis. You know, you cannot quantify that. You, you know, you, unless you just take that person out, you know, remove all that infrastructure and then see how you do. Okay? You won't do as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just am grateful uh, that I was born exactly when I was born so that I could be in that high school class, so that I could be in that freshman engineering class when Ed Barnett decides he wants to start, what if what if we came a year, what if we were a year older and we came in 1970 instead of 1971? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Um, there's no way to uh, determine how successful we would have been if any of those, because you're talking about, you know, revisionist history, time, you know, go back in time. What happens if you change one thing? And, you know, it has, you know, uh, ramifications on whatever else happens. So um, all I can say is I'm glad that we had that, you know, exposure and that experience and the people who were there for our time. And I can tell you that I've seen so many students that come up to me and they, you know, they say, thank you for founding this organization because without Nesby, there's no way I could be an engineer. There's no way I could have made it this far. There's no way I would have graduated. I hear that every time that I go to any sort of a Nesby function around, you know, students or alumni that, you know, that I haven't met before. So this organization, what it can do is very powerful. Um, and it's become an international organization. Um, the uh, Nesby chapter in Ghana is celebrating their 20th anniversary. Um, I just think that's just so fantastic to know that, you know, we've had that type of reach for um, an organization that, that we started. Uh, with the help of, of course, Dr. Arthur Bond, the great enabler. Mm -hmm. A real catalyst. <laughs> so when you think about where Nesby is now and maybe where it was um, when you were at that first national conference, does it compare? Does it exceed expectation? Uh, well, see, here's the thing. I already confessed how cocky and confident and arrogant we were. And, you know, young people are like that, some of them, right? And they think they can do, you know, conquer the world. And so I'm sure that, uh, you know, we probably said this is going to be a worldwide, you know, I'm sure we, you know, you know, didn't have enough maturity to, you know, to realize what a challenge that would actually be. Um, but, uh, you know, all... Six of us, of course, including Dr. Bond, very positive thinkers, very positive thinkers. And so we expected to win. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Yeah. We expected to win. We expected, you know, Nesby to continue. We expected, you know, the Nesby students to win. Uh, we knew, I said it in, in that uh, statement where I introduced the the intention to uh, start a national organization. I said we need uh, the, uh, the the minds and the the effort of you know students today and students from tomorrow to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what what has occurred. And that statement is just as important today as it was then. Uh, but now we have many, many, many more people with the skills to help carry this flag to the next level. And they will, trust me, they will. Mm -hmm. And one of the notable features of NSBE, um that as it started and continues today is that it's student-led. And you're kind of 
making that, just made that point about that student vision and we were like, this is going to happen, positive thinking, <laughs> and oh, this yeah. is it. Oh, yeah. well, how, how important do you think it remains in this current context as the size of the organization grows? Vital. Vital. Because the older that you get in life, the more responsibilities, the more diluted your goals are. Okay? The fact that it's led by students is everyone is on the same page. Everyone is aligned. Um, uh, everyone has the same goals, and the mission statement represents that. Um, so it's vital for it to continue to be a student-run organization because students know what their needs are better than anybody else. Okay, this organization was defined and you know established by students who knew what we needed. Okay, Dr. Arthur Bond wasn't Dr. Arthur Bond yet. He was a PhD. He you know still classified as a student, even though he was an assistant professor. He was still a student studying engineering. He knew what we needed. So these students today, they know what we need. They they, they know what we need for the future. And, you know, the strength of being a student-run organization is that you get new energy and new blood in every year. And so the organization, you know, uh, the student-run population has the potential to get younger and stronger and smarter every year. And that's what I've seen happen over the last 45-ish years. Uh, the organization is getting... Uh, Younger, stronger, and smarter every year. And that will continue. And we're at the point now where um, we have some families where engineering is a family business. I'm sure you've talked to people that say, well, my grandfather was a doctor and my, you know, grandmother, uh, my, my mother was a doctor and, you know, I'm, a, I'm studying to be a doctor. You know, in that household, that family, being a doctor is a family business. And you have the same thing. People come from households and families where there are many, many lawyers. Well, you're going to see that happening with uh, black families that have uh, engineering histories. So you've got children now who, uh, whose parents were Nesby engineers. Mm -hmm. And they're in college now. Uh, and they're moving their way forward. Um, and uh, those students are better prepared than their parents were for the challenges that they face. And, you know, if, if uh, we continue doing what we're supposed to do, the grandchildren will be better prepared. And so, you know, another you know, 20 years down the road, we're going to have third and fourth generation engineers. In, in certain families. And that, you know, that spreads out in the community. Um, my own cousin followed me to high school, followed me to Purdue, studied engineering. I didn't know that she was doing that. She was about seven years younger than me. Uh, and I just thought it was a coincidence that she went to the same high school. Oh, she's going to the Purdue too. Wonderful. That's a, what a coincidence. I didn't know until my wife and I had our 25th wedding anniversary where folks came up and, you know, they started talking about, you know, the influence that we had on, you know, the rest of the family. My cousin told me that uh, she was following me in engineering school uh, because I was her role model for education. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, that lady, my cousin, Michelle Spencer, uh, she got an MBA from Notre Dame after leaving Purdue. Uh, she raised a daughter who's on the fortune list of most influential people in social media. Who would have thought that happened? Okay, there's a chain reaction. Okay, so my cousin's daughter, her name is Kristen Nicole and now married name Martin. She was on that fortune list. Um, I don't know if she's listed as Kristen Nicole Gay or Kristen Nicole Martin, you know, but mm -hmm. she is on that, that list. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. And I know that there is, you know, the dots have been connected <laughs> from me to where she's at. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. So. Well, so as we wrap up, you've made a lot of connections throughout this whole um, interview about 
how your experiences prior to college at Purdue, um, experiences in the formation of Black Society of Engineers and all of this sort of led to who you are today and how it's cycling back in your personal and professional life in general. But is there anything that we haven't mentioned as yet that you would like to touch on? Um, well, I'll just say that my experience in corporate America gave me the confidence that led me to believe that I could start my own company. Um, and, you know, when you say start your own company, you're thinking about, you know, bricks and, you know, brick and mortar building, employees, et cetera, et cetera. That was not my goal. My goal was essentially to create my own job. And that's what I did. Um, and I used the quality uh, engineering skills that I learned when I was at General Electric also use the process control skills that I learned when, that I was when I was at Purdue University, and I used the uh, the market that I was a part of, and which was technical sales, when I was with Hewlett Packard, and I built a consulting practice around, you know, all of those themes, um, and um, what I'm most proud of is something that I wouldn't have anticipated. Uh, is that I was a uh, I am a published author uh, from the American Society for Quality. I had two books that were on their bestseller list. That's not New York Times bestseller list. That's American Society for Quality list. Uh, um, what that enabled me to do was establish myself as an expert um, in uh, an area which you know at the time was being called Salesforce Automation. Um, then they started calling it uh, customer relationship management. Uh, the largest company to grow out of that is Salesforce.com, which you may have heard of. It's a very large corporation. Well, I was right there at the beginning of that whole um, industry as it was developing. And you know, as a result of my contributions, I'm listed as a pioneer in sales process engineering. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I think that's important um, for people to know. Now, you know, I come from a family where it's really not particularly courteous to brag about what you've done, okay? Um, let other people see it. But that's not what's happening in the world and in the marketplace. It's, you know, marketing is what it is. It is bragging about what you're doing. And so... We need to do more of that. We need to do more bragging slash marketing about the accomplishments of the individuals in the National Society of Black Engineers as well as the accomplishments of the organization as a whole. We need to look for you know any and every opportunity to market ourselves to not, not only to parents and households and students, but also into the uh, uh, the universities and, and the professors. We want the professors to perceive us as, uh, you know, here comes the National Society of Black Engineers. They're some of the best engineers on campus. That's where I want us to see us go, okay? And I want to see corporations say, you know, uh, if we hire some of those folks from the National Society of Black Engineers, we're going to improve our organization, Okay. Nobody's asking for any favors here. We're going to make your organization better. Just give us that chance. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the time, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. <laughs> thank you. It's been my pleasure.